Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another COVID lockdown webinar. Um, I really like doing these. I think it's a good way to uh, have a bit of a conversation um, about what's going on in the markets and then uh, share some insight into uh, yeah, what people think the outlook is in the near and medium term for particular uh, stocks and stories and stages of exploration and whatnot, and then to catch up with uh, with one particular stock, one that I uh, one that I like. So today, of course, we are here with Brad Rourke, Rourke of Scotty Resources, and uh, I will pass things over to him after I do a little bit of a. An overview um, for those who follow my content. I don't think I'll be saying anything that's that you haven't heard me say a lot over the last few weeks. Um, but it's been a pretty exciting week in the gold market. The last yeah, week of trading days um, have really solidified my confidence that we are at the beginning of an exciting, of a robust bull market that's you know that's on its way right now. Will we get pulled down a bit? Um, in the second bottom, you know, we will see. It's definitely possible. Um, but at this point, um, it's been an exciting week, and uh, and that's pretty fun. Um, okay, I need. To, why is this not letting me show my screen? That's a problem. Um, I am the presenter. Oh, that's the problem. I wasn't officially the presenter. Now I am officially the presenter. Okay. Now you can see my screen and you know my inbox and all of those things that are uh, not what we should be looking at. So let's just look at the slideshow here. And um, this is a headline I've used a few times in presentations of late: a health crisis, an economic catastrophe, a golden opportunity. I started using that um, a few weeks ago, and I think I was a little bit um, cautious on using it because you know i didn't know how quickly this golden opportunity would come but of course it has come very quickly and i think what's let me I, i'm not going to spend a lot of time on what has happened we've all lived through it we've all paid a lot of attention to it um and so uh we don't need to go through all of that again but i just want to set up a bit of a structure for how i'm viewing everything um if you went back to December, even though you know the virus was starting to show itself in China, the bottom line is that almost no one, I mean, excluding epidemiologists, I suppose, um, would have thought that a cold virus could cripple the world in the way that it has. And so I say that because what we're undergoing right now, what we what we went through and what caused the market to sell off so extensively um, was that it was a paradigm shift. And we really had to orient to a new reality, which is that despite all of our advances in globalization and technology, um, we can get crippled by a cold virus. And so it is very difficult to accept paradigm shifts. And so the process of accepting it um, was scary. It caused a lot of panic. Um, obviously, the responses to the virus itself m combined with that, and that all culminated in a market crash of historic proportions. We all know that. What I think is important is that now that paradigm shift has happened. It's not comfortable living in the new paradigm. We don't like it, but we are in it. Uh, I think people are no longer opposed to the fact that this is happening. It is happening. Um, and so, with the paradigm shift having happened, Peak panic is now over. What we are faced with is enduring the new reality and the fallout from all of the restrictions, all the economic fallout, all the job losses, all the health fallout from the new reality, but we're in it. And I think that's important because I don't see us entering another phase of panic the way that we did in March. And that's really important because I really think that we are going to slide again in the broad markets you know what shape is this crash going to take when it started it was clearly an event based crash add in other factors including the oil price war and for example oodles of weak corporate debt and there was the potential for this to turn into a structural recession instead of an event based recession but what we've seen instead is the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world stepping in in an unprecedented way and unprecedented in terms of scale and speed of response. You put those together, 
the Federal Reserve has nationalized the markets except for stocks, basically. Um, and so that that has given that has all essentially erased the concern for this to become a structural recession, which would had it done that it would have been a much longer event. Um, but an event based crash um, is shorter. And so it's important that the Fed and other central banks stepped into the scale and speed that they did, because I don't think we're looking at a structural issue right now. Um, I think we're looking at an event based issue. Um, of course, the fiscal packages also help. They're physically just giving money to those who need it, who've lost their jobs, whose businesses need help. Um, the scale of the response there really matters. Businesses get the sense of being supported. Certainly doesn't solve everything, um, but it helps. So I do think that we're in, I do think that there will be another bottom in the broad markets. Um, this bounce in the markets has been bigger and lasted longer than I would have expected. Um, and um, it's based on excitement over all of this money printing and all of this Fed buying of everything. We are looking ahead at really bad data. Um, and I know that there's a lot of money from the bull market in, this, in, the, in the broad markets for the last almost decade. There's a lot of money that wants to um, invest at the bottom here. And I think that has fueled this bounce to a large extent. But can stocks maintain their elevated levels, um, given that we are going to have you know, airlines with massive losses, huge restaurant chains with massive losses, the entire travel industry, um, you know, real threat of bankruptcies across, dividends disappearing, all of the companies that are getting any of the Fed money can't do stock buybacks anymore. That's one of the rules. Stock buybacks have been really important in supporting the market and they won't have they're going to be cut at least in half i do think that all of these are going to come together and pull the broad markets down again um obviously i do not know the time frame or the depth to which that will happen um but i i cannot see that we are out of the woods for um the broad markets at the same oh and on the covid side uh, we're certainly not done by any means with the covid crisis um this is a great chart that the financial times updates on a, every twice a week i believe um and just shows the trends for everyone um i think we don't know what shape any curve is going to take. We have to see it when it happens. Um, there's lots of questions about um, where, where the US curve will go, whether states where the um, infections are sort of new will um, keep the curve higher for longer. The end, at, at the end of the day, the point is um, the COVID, the health side of it is not done. So I think we have the economic side, there's a lot of bad stuff yet to come there. The COVID side is not done. The restrictions will remain in place for a long time. That only exacerbates the economic side of things. So that stuff is all no good, but it has absolutely created this perfect storm for gold. And I think there's a few key points to take here. I talked about all that money that's out there that wants to invest in the bottom here. I think it helps that the great financial crisis was not that long ago. People remember clearly how how strongly stocks rebounded out of the great financial crisis so that motivates people to try and invest at the bottom and when investors of that nature are looking around trying to decide when to invest and more importantly what to invest in in this crisis they know that gold bottoms first and so that i think has been a huge driver already in the gold space um, and so that that helps gold and then there's the fact that everything that the Federal Reserve has been doing um, is fundamentally bullish for gold. We had a really strong gold argument before COVID hit. Now it is essentially bulletproof. We have oodles of money printing. We have very negative real interest rates that are not going to change for a good amount of time. Uh, these are the drivers for gold and they have only strengthened during this COVID situation. So gold bottoms first, the fundamental arguments for gold have only gotten stronger during this crisis. And then again, as generalist investors look out across the space and try and decide what to invest in, gold miners, I think, will stand out across equities in those analyses because gold miners make really good money at current gold prices. So they just have 
strong balance sheets, good cash flow, potential to make deals and to grow. Um, so I do think there's, I've been trying hard to come up with reasons to, um, reasons that work against gold and it's hard to come up with anything particularly strong. Uh, even a week ago, I was still more on the fence about whether gold had truly bottomed or whether it was at risk of being pulled down to a second bottom when the broad markets came down. After this last week of trading activity, I do believe that the bottom is in for gold. I think what we have is a combination of this, this significant bounce in the markets that's giving investors, um, that's motivating them to find something to participate in and gold bottoms first and they're picking that. Uh, and they're looking to position to profit from this situation. Um, and then add in all those fundamental reasons that drive gold that only solidifies their inclination if they're they're leaning towards gold. I think gold has bottomed and it will trade through the next bottom in the markets. That doesn't mean it won't get pulled down to some extent or on particularly bad days, but I do not think gold is going to bottom the way that it did in March. I think we are going to trade through the next bottom in the broad markets and carry on from there. Um, so if that is the situation, what is an investor to buy? Um, well, uh, it certainly depends on what kind of investor you are, but it is absolutely true that gold majors and royalty companies are the first to get bought. This is a boring thing to say, but I say it because it's true. They are the first to get bought when generalist money rotates into gold. And that is the most important thing right now. When I talk about Gold's fundamentals being strong, gold standing out across gold miners standing out across equities. Um, the the idea that gold bottoms first attracting those who want to position from this crash or position within this crash. I'm talking about generalist dollars. I'm talking about pension funds and large hedge funds. They need to be active in this goal in this um, crisis opportunity. They can't just sit around and wait for things to get better. Uh, and so and they are not experts in gold but they have incredibly large amounts of money. And so they rotate a small portion of their holdings, their fund into gold, and that makes all the difference in the world to our tiny little sector. And they have to buy big companies because they need to take big positions, they need liquidity, they don't have expertise in exploration, and often they're um, bounded by requirements like projects have to have economic studies, the company needs to have a $100 million market cap, things like that. So um, they buy Barrick. This is a gold chart from Barrick, I think it's from two days ago, but I mean, Barrick is way above its pre-COVID high already, um, and it just keeps going, and that's because if a big hedge fund wants to buy gold, what do you think they buy? Well, Barrick is one of the very first things that they buy. So that will continue. The generalist dollars are only just starting. The gold majors and royalty companies will continue to perform very strongly, I think, in the next little while. And so that is certainly one thing that I have been buying. Um, moving a little bit down the food chain, um, those, all those generalist dollars that I was talking about, um, are really important. They drive the gold bull market, but focused gold investors move one step ahead of those generalist dollars. And so they are already rotating, rotating down, um, investing into um, a, a, the next level of risk, which is developers and optionality plays. Here's two examples, and you can see from their share price charts that this is happening, that focused gold investors are active already and they're buying into these kinds of development stage, permitting stage, real asset um, companies and, uh, and that will only continue. So I do think that the opportunity there is also very real. Then we get to the exploration side of things. Um, now explorers, some of them have certainly um, seen share price recovery and many have not. What I have in brackets here are, you know, what are the reasons for that? Well, I think there's a few, oops, I didn't know that it was going to um, change my screen when I touched that. Um, oh, sorry, I don't know why it's uh, not showing my screen all of a sudden. Or at least I can't see my screen. This is somewhat odd. Here we go. Ha ha, back. I don't know if that was weird for anybody else. It was weird on my screen. Now I'm back. So some explorers have started, have seen their share prices 
bounce um, to, to varying extents. Many have not. Many are still fairly down in the trough. Um, what are the determinants there? I think there's a few that matter. Um, do they have money in the bank? Um, that's pretty important. Are they active? Do they have catalysts coming? Do they have you know active exploration plans or have they sort of huddled back and gone quiet? Um, I don't think that that's helpful right now. It was the easy decision to make early in the crisis, but as gold's demonstrated its speed in recovering, I think that it is, um, it's no longer appropriate to just sort of be shrinking back. I think um, companies need to be active if they want to attract any attention. Shareholder registries have really mattered. Um, do you, you want to be invested in companies all the time where management is actively, regularly engaged with their shareholders? And that's important because then when those shareholders decide to start buying in the market again, you know, the company is top of mind. The stock is an option. The reasons that they might invest in this are, are top of mind. Um, so having a connected, informed shareholder group, and that depends a lot on whether management I, I put here is leaning in. Are they really leaning into this? Do they see this as an opportunity? Are they trying to make something out of this opportunity? Those have been determinants in the last few weeks about which stocks on the exploration side, I think, um, have started to bounce. The reason that others have not is that no, undoubtedly small juniors are the most at risk in this next major market slide that I think is coming because risk tolerance just evaporates when the markets are sliding. But at the same time, gold explorers with exciting results this summer will really stand out because the gold market will be attracting a lot of attention. And so if you can make discoveries, if you can announce exciting drill results this summer, I think that is going to do very well for those stocks. Broadly speaking, um, exploration stocks are looking ahead at some catalyst opportunities. So exploration results in the North American season, um, the you know, work will get underway in the next little while. And so we'll have exploration results. We will have some money rotating down. I say active gold investors are already moving down into the developers and optionality plays. Those investments have already returned a good amount of capital. So some of those dollars are already rotating down into exploration stocks. And so that will only continue as this gold market strengthens. So that will help give explore, the whole exploration space some momentum. And then I think um, M&A is an important um, consideration as well. These strong balance sheets for major miners will matter. They're going to want to deploy capital um, as soon as they have confidence that the market will um, appreciate those moves. And so the more deal making we see, the more momentum the space picks up as a whole. I do want to mention that there will also be financing opportunities. So good exploration companies who need money, maybe they don't have any, maybe they don't have enough money to get through um, their plans this summer, are going to do financings at whatever prices they have to do them at so that they do not miss the drill season ahead. The last thing you want to do when a gold bull market is getting underway is miss an entire year because you didn't have money to drill and therefore you have to sit on your thumbs for a year while everybody else um, enjoys the investor attention. So if you are an accredited investor who likes to participate in financings, do be aware that I think there will be a good number of interesting financing opportunities that crop up over the next two months from companies that want to be able to participate um, in this market, even though it means financing at a price that they would prefer to not finance at. Bottom line, the COVID crisis is only making gold strong fundamentals stronger, precious metals and precious metal stocks will shine. Very quickly, I know we're not really on this call to speak about uranium, but I do want to mention that uranium is given her right now. And for very good reason, the uranium space has been setting up for a bull market slowly at a tortoise pace for a couple of years now, um, as the producers have gradually cut back on production and tried to stop up the excess supply in the spot market. And um, that had been working. It had certainly stabilized the price. There had been some attempts for the price to go higher. Um, and then we had COVID and COVID has erased 30% uh, of global supply. For a good chunk of that, um, for something like 22% for Cigar Lake, Rossing and Husab for those mines, those miners have to buy in the spot market 
to fill the contracts that they would usually fill with production from those mines. And so any excess that had been remaining in the spot market is going to disappear quick, quick, because these miners are going to buy it. Um, they're going to keep doing that until prices improve considerably. Cameco has recently announced that the Cigar Lake does not have a timeline to restart um, because Cameco makes more money buying in the spot market and selling into its contracts than it does producing at Cigar Lake. It needs prices to be higher for it to make sense to restart Cigar Lake. So I think it used COVID as a reason, as an excuse perhaps, to shut down Cigar Lake and it will restart it once we have a uranium bull market. Now, um, you know, uranium is set up for a bull market. We have under supply, we have under contracting. Um, we will get a rush on contracting because of the supply gap that it, that's ahead. I think uranium really has the potential to run out of the gate here. So I think it's worth some consideration. I don't think it will really get going until the broad stock markets um, have a little bit more stability to them and risk tolerance has returned a little bit more. But uranium markets happen very quickly when they happen. So um, ideally you position before the market goes. And so whether, if you need returns in the next few weeks to months, then maybe uranium isn't your best bet. But if you have even a year, let alone two year time frame, I think uranium is a space that you need to be looking at right now. These are the letters that I write. I'm always happy to communicate with people about what I do. If you have any questions, please reach out and ask me. I, I write a monthly letter, a weekly letter, and a financing opportunity letter. Um, and with that, oh my gosh, am I? Oh, there we go. Haha, -ha. my computer is doing some very funny things as I try and host this webinar, so I apologize for <laughs> any hiccups on my end. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, transition over to Brad, but I wanted to start by just asking him um, one question out the gate. Uh, I'm known for being direct, so I might as well just be direct. I spoke at the end there about how exploration companies are going to need, you know, good exploration companies that need more money to execute their drill programs um, will probably be financing so that they can take advantage of this gold bull market. What's Scotty's look at that? I mean, I know you've been on the phone a lot lately. What, uh, I know you can't give away any plans before they're officially announced, but how are you feeling about that? Are you getting interest more than anything? Do you think there's interest? Is there appetite out there for a company at the stage of Scotty, which is an early stage gold explorer? Is there appetite out there um, by investors for that kind of, uh, for, for your stock and, and potentially for a financing? Yeah, you set me up with that. Like uh, the answer is, so let's just cut to the chase. I've got a little bit of money in the bank, but in order for me to do my program, I am going to uh, uh, have to entertain raising money. Uh, fortunately, if you asked me last week, you know, my stock price was 30% lower than it is today. So it, it, today it almost, you almost feel like a win, even though I'm, we're never happy about our stock price. But I think the opportunity is there. Uh, we've been working really hard uh, nonstop. In fact, I think I get more work done being at home and, and learning how to, you know, this is only a third time I've done a, a go-to meeting, but I was really big on the Zoom calls until the virus, uh, you know, until they f figure that out. But uh, no, there's. I think for the right projects, there, there's there. My phone rang. I, I had three phone calls this morning. So you know, and everyone just kind of see. I haven't determined a financing. I haven't set a price. Uh, but absolutely, uh, there is interest out there. And and even in our our area, uh, I might get the exact times wrong, but did Skeena disclose 33 million? Was that yesterday? uh seabridge just closed a 14 million dollar financing so there are things happening uh, uh that's just in our our little area so the answer is i'm positive that we'll, we'll get things done and and uh you know uh, you know we, again we're probably a little stronger than most guys and you know you also point out correctly i'm at the very bottom of the barrel at the bottom of the ladder right i mean the, there's two levels that that will rise before i do and but I get encouraged by seeing that that is happening. And uh, I think people might be a little bit more selective, but you know, hopefully they, they see what we did last year. And, and so we're feeling comfortable and stay tuned. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll probably uh, you know, solidify something. Yeah. And so. Yeah. Um, yeah, good to hear of the interest for sure. Um, 
let's also, I'm, I'm sure you will get to this to some extent in your presentation, but I want to ask about the, the pertinent thing right now, which is you did put out news this morning about um, changing some of your agreements for your land package. Uh, it It's the kind of news that isn't earth shattering. Um, a lot of investors may not even pay that much attention to it. But when I was describing the difference between explorers who I think have uh, bounced to some extent and those who haven't i talked about management sort of leaning in and whether they're active and whether they're sort of taking advantage of this opportunity and and still still doing and that's kind of what this what this set of work was for you right correct and uh, you know i when i first got involved in end of 2015 early 2016 i started with 400 hectares uh today we're dead we're, we're after today's news we're almost 25,000 when this was happening i was i just saw it as like okay and, and not that i was picking on anybody what be it but i had these deals that took me a long time to get together and i wasn't being threatening it was just like things have changed my treasury is more important than anything i'm going to give you your land back and maybe we renegotiate it later but as of right now and then we got to the situation not with the bull property i was keeping the bull property no matter what but I mean, I just offered, I go, everybody's short for cash with these other juniors. And so there was no way you were going to pry me off the bull property. So we saved a little bit of money there by renegotiating it. And then the other pieces were, we weren't being heavy handed. We were just literally going, okay, the world's changed. My focus is Scotty, but we've been accumulating all this land uh, south of Pridium. And, and uh, you know, it just came about where it was a great time to get some business done, you know, and I think we, did very well by Scotty shareholders. You're right. I think the news uh, will go over a lot of people's head unless you really understand the area. It's very difficult to get land in the Golden Triangle, let alone a continuous piece of, of land. So I think we did well, and it shows that we're we're committed to the sector. We're committed to what we believe is going to be a, a rush into, into precious metals, and and. What a great time! We're, we've been excited. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the market will, will ask me in a couple months, but I think it's uh, pretty smart. I, I, I know the price is right, and so we'll see. Uh, you know, people want, and mo most of the market wants to see drill results and, and such. But I think we uh, we did ourselves pretty good for for us and the shareholders for sure with today's news. Yeah. Perfect. Well, how about I change um, presenter over to you now and uh, you can take it from here and go through a little presentation, okay? get everyone up to speed on the Scotty story. And uh, after that, we'll do a Q&A. And before, just before I pass it over to Brad, I will uh, let everyone know that there is a um, question um, icon on your screen. And so if you, if you click on that, you can type in a question and I see those questions come up. So that's how the Q&A will work. At any point now, later, if you have a question, type it in there. And after Brad's done his Scotty presentation, then we'll go through those questions uh, together. So there you go, uh, Brad, you should be able to take over and share your screen now. Okay. So how does that look now? Do you see my, uh oh, you don't see my full screen, do you? We see black. Okay, let me. How's that? That's better. We see your screen now. Okay. So I won't make this a long presentation. What I'd like to tell uh, everybody out there that's listening, thank you for your time. And, you know, the purpose of this, I, I'm going to try and make this about 10 minutes, but hopefully it'll get you to ask questions because I think. The benefit of us being uh, doing these sorts of things is actually take questions. Um, and I have a much bigger presentation on our website and I'm available. So if anybody has questions, even after after this, or if you're watching the recording of this, uh, please please get to me. But um, so there, there's our forward looking statement. I'll be making forward uh, looking uh, statements. What I'll, I'll start off with is here's the new map of, of Scotty and, it, and it's got a bunch of different colors because they, they represent different transactions, but everything that's colored with that's not Pritium or Ascot, it, whether it's green, blue, orange, purple, uh, light blue there at the bottom, that, that is now all, for the most part, 100% owned by Scotty. I still have some options in around here with the Summit Lake, but it's very, very palatable. Um, and the way we looked, at this is we just added close to 5,000 hectares and saved over a million dollars of which I had agreements with these these companies with 
work commitments and, and, and property payments. Is that what, what it would have cost us over the, um, the next three and a half, four years? Uh, we were doing minimal amounts of work down here. Can you see my mouse, Gwen? Just, uh, do you see my mouse moving up and down the, the map? Uh, just a sec. Oh, sorry. Just, just for future reference if I'm doing these presentations. But anyways, we- uh, Yes, we can. Sorry, I had something on top of it, but yes, we can. Oh, okay. So, so if, you, if we're looking down here, you know, we were doing work down here for the last couple of seasons. There's over 40 showings, but we've really been focused up at Scotty Gold. Um, but we've been, we were really excited about this land. It just was our plan, you know, it was a priority number two where we're accumulating this and working here is where most of the smoke is for, for now. But the deal that we just accumulated, so this is all one continuous piece of land now, uh, right up the heart of, uh, you know, there's a theory that there's a whole other system r running through here. And it's not as advanced as we are at Scotty, but you know we're we're, we're excited and and like I say, it's, everything's 100% paid for. Uh, we had to write seven different reports last year because of the different options we had with different uh, uh, vendors. Well, now my my now Thomas is is excited because he only has to uh, write two reports for next season. So I think we've done a heck of a job, and we're showing the market that you know when everybody was kind of a deer in the headlights, we. we We've had a plan for a long time and we just kept uh, pushing forward. Luckily for us, you know, we had a little bit of money in the treasury uh, and we were able to do that. And that was a little bit of a strength and, and very, uh, you know, an advantage for us. So I think, you know, I started off in 2015 with 400 hectares, just that star. And, and this is, you know, I was enamored with a past producing gold mine and the infrastructure Pridium's power line. Well, now, I think it's 14 transactions total since uh, early 2016, and now we're at almost 25,000 hectares. So we're excited about that, and re and really interesting lands. Um, you know, I'll give a quick little uh, overview on the on the Golden Triangle for people that don't know, but we won't spend a lot of time here. As you can see, there's Scotty Gold. Uh, we're in the southern end of the Golden Triangle. Uh, we touch borders with Premier Mine, which is Ascot. Uh, who just came out with a feasibility study last night. Uh, and there's Bruce Jack with the Peridium Mine. So we're kind of sandwiched in between two very well-known areas. And then here's SK Creek, Snip, Red Chris. So we're, we're in the Golden Triangle. I think what people really always need to remind themselves is jurisdiction. Uh, you know, Canada's doing well, BC's doing well by mining uh, and infrastructure. You know, 30 years ago when we were running around up here in the bush, it was a lot different than it is now. I mean, this is a road accessible. There's power. They put a new container port down in Stewart. So uh, they paved the roads all up to Deese Lake and, and such. So the infrastructure here is 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 better than it's ever been. Great jurisdiction. And then obviously uh, uh, the geology is extremely interesting. Uh, we'll take people through a kind of a snapshot of the first 400 hectares. Basically, that picture is about 400 hectares. Um, and that's what we started off with, with an old past producing gold mine of which, if you look at these uh, yellow triangles, those are all portals. And uh, basically it was one vein. And this Scotty gold mine in the 80s with a 10 gram cutoff was producing on average over 16 grams per ton. Uh, that's recoverable. It was a 20 gram head grade. So, you know, in, in today's standards, that's a fantastic gold mine. And uh, so that, that's what really got us in, uh, involved with this and, and excited about it. Uh, if you just remember this photo, everybody, it's just think that these are east-west structures and this goes up that mountain. And I'm gonna show a picture here in a couple slides later. It's what's on the other side of the mountain that, that's got us ex excited. Anyways, there, there's a picture of it. You can see that it's road accessible uh, and, and that which is a big advantage for the Golden Triangle. The big boom for the company happened last april when we we acquired the summit lake claims and basically these were held by a private uh vendor and had the scotty gold surrounded from i think since 1989 and and uh was in a private company i tried to tried to get a hold of these lands for for many years and then just as luck had it and being in the right place at the right time uh they became available to us in uh april of last year so I think that changed everything for us. Now, 
in the light blue is, is what the Summit Lake uh, property, and you can see it surrounded the Scotty Gold Mine. My whole business plan was just in this little piece of land here, uh, you know, two years ago. Uh, we acquired this land, and so the first thing we did last year, we were really excited about, is we went out and started ground truthing it. We didn't have any data to work off of uh, because it was privately held. There was no public data, so we weren't going back to old showings that you know someone had found in, in the past. Basically, we found an old EM survey, or we didn't find it. Uh, Ron Nedelinski was nice enough to give it to me, uh, and we just walked the margins of these glaciers. And if you look at the results that we had, and understanding that it's our first pass, we only spent three days on the domino because. We weren't getting those assays back. We didn't know they were that good. If we knew, we if we were going to be as happy as we were, we would have spent three weeks just on the domino. So I think if people understand that that's our first pass, all five of those showings, and there's a few more that we just don't even have on here, are all exciting. All those numbers are great, uh, especially when it's the first time that we ever looked at these rocks. Again, this is that domino zone now from a different perspective, and when I showed that photograph of, of Scotty Gold and the original gold mine go up the mountain, you go down the mountain, that east-west structure at Scotty Gold is here. And then, then on the other side of that mountain is the domino zone, which, you know, we found a, uh, you know, 700 meter by 200 meters so far zone with mineralization all the way down and, and some extraordinary uh, finds. You know, there's a 536 gram sample we took out of here. Uh, 63 gram. I mean, Thomas, even though those are big numbers, really enjoy it like this one. Uh, it's a chip sample, 10 grams over five meters, but the highest values on both ends of that chip sample were on the ends. So, and they were 24 and 22 or in about in, in around that, those, those ranges. Again, if we had those assays before we left the area, we would have continued. So we'll go up and we've got a lot of, of, of smoke to follow up on here. And so this is the blue sky. If we can um, connect the domino zone to the Scotty, I mean that that's the blue sky, and that's we're going to work really hard at doing that for for 2020. And so uh, it is our our intention to to drill, you know, our first set of drill holes in, into the domino, of which we now have drill permits. So if that's a question, uh, I believe we paid that bond uh, two days ago, so we're we're good to go there. Um, and if that hits, I think people could get really exciting, really excited on 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 the potential in the runway of Scotty. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about the success we did have. So in August of last year, the very last minute, we decided that we were going to drill, and we put two years together to put a drill program together. And we were lucky enough that we basically, with a small 2,000 meter drill program, we hit three distinct different zones and we hit all three of them. We were truly hoping just if we could hit one with such a small drill program, I think we would have been satisfied. But um, as and you can see, they're extraordinary uh, little results that we've had. Now this, the bend vein, just to be honest with everybody, that's more of a confirmation hole. Uh, we didn't have any core to relog. It was a handwritten map. And so we figured out the best place we could kind of hit that structure right in the middle of it. So uh that's 73 grams over four meters people say oh you twinned a hole and the answer is yeah we did but we had nothing to work from we had no quarter log we couldn't find the drill collars had been roads built over it so we really need to have a, a reference so that's what that was uh the blueberry vein on the other hand you know one of the best intercepts that we had was seven and a half grams over 34 meters well that's a new discovery we're actually thomas turned to drill the off one way he's trying to target something else so that to us is uh really excited and and uh you know that's on surface that's a hundred meter hole uh on you know on road accessible and so we're really excited about that that these two and, and this is one of the pieces of the land that we just paid off so we own it in entirety and then we did a 500 meter hole that was very difficult but it was strategic so we could try and hit this old vein that, that they were producing all this gold out of and hit it perpendicular because we could never get to it and hit it the way we wanted to from underground. So we were really excited. And then for you know two thirds of our drill program coming up, we'll be just following up on these uh, three zones that we hit. And uh, again, we won't get too technical here, but I'd love, if anybody would love to have uh, technical sessions, 
whether, I mean, I can fumble my way through it, but uh, Thomas is always available and, and uh, we're having a lot of success right now going through the, these sorts of things. But we go through long section, cross sections, uh, reports. But again, you know, this is this is Thomas's favorite hole. It's more of a new discovery. He was actually trying to target something down here is what he, he thought was running this way and found a whole new, new uh, uh, something to follow up on. And then I like this one only because it's, a pure 50 meter step out in front of the mine that produced a half ounce per ton. So this gets us excited. We'll do two thirds of our drill program following up on those, and then we'll go drill the um, the domino zone. And and uh, you know if we hit that, if we hit that, then I think people will really really start waking up to the potential of that Scotty uh, may or may not have. Uh, I'll touch on the tailings just a little bit, but we've been working on these things for two years. Uh, as you can see, you can drive to these things. Um, there used to be a lake there. Salmon Glacier has receded and it's drained that lake. So this is on our property. So over the last two years, we have taken over 100 samples, done benchmark recoveries, uh, internal and uh, independent, of which we've got that back, and to the point where we even have a notice to work in with the government. They're not our liability. But from our best guesstimates, we would say uh, conservatively, there's an average grade of 2.1 grams for the whole lot of, uh, of the tailings. Uh, if you look at right here is where the, the first dumps were. At the bottom of those holes, we're getting six grams per ton. And then as, as it splays out, it gets thinner and thinner. And the further down you go, the higher grades are. But I think we're very comfortable saying 2.1 is an average for, for, for all of it. Uh, and the work that we have just coming back is, is confirming that. Uh, so potentially something there. We're not in the tailings business, but I think uh, working with the government and trying to clean that up, and, and there, there might be a little non-diluted financing in there. But that's, you know, not not uh, the main focus of what we're doing. I think, you know, looking forward to, we're going to stick to the plan that we had three months ago. We want to do a 5,000 meter drill program. We're going to fly some uh, low level high res EM uh, because it's it's working for, you know, when we looked at that summit lake and those zones that we found, we were li literally just going to where there is these EM targets that were showing us where there's lots of paratite and it seems to work. So we will, uh, uh, that survey was done 1991. So Thomas wants to fly a, a new AM survey. And then we're gonna do IP, especially between the Scotty and the domino zone, we know Ascot's had tremendous success doing IP and picking their targets. So we're over select targets. We're going to run some IP and we have that already set up with the same same firm, Simcoe. Put a plug in there for Riaz. But uh, that's what we'll be doing. And then we'll continue doing mapping and and, and, and just trying to learn what's down south. And uh, But we're, we're still going to focus at the Scotty Gold Mine. One of the great things with that new piece of land that we have down south is with the government i mean we don't even have to work on that next year because they've kind of allowed everybody to hold their lands uh we, we will go do work anyways but i mean it's really easy uh to hold all these these lands i think people if you know per, perhaps not today's the day but i mean we've got a, a fantastic board uh and people who've attached their horses to the, the scotty wagon i think it you know bodes well for us i mean it's diverse We've got big company guys, small company guys, all, all guys that have been successful. I'd like to have, I'm sorry for saying guys, I'm mean, looking for that perfect female uh, to join my board. But, um, uh, you know, so I think we've, um, you know, shown that that the the, the, the quality of guys that, that have joined in, in, into the company should, should should say a lot and ask yourselves, why would they join? They, they, they all have success in their own rights and they sure are helping me out an awful lot and I appreciate uh, the help I get from the board. Uh, and then just a general issued and outstanding. Here we are with 88 million shares, 15% uh, institutional. A year ago, there was zero. Uh, and not everybody's declaring yet, but I, I, I hear through the grapevine that there's lots of, a lot of this buying's coming from, from bigger entities. Uh, I myself am the largest shareholder of the company, and I paid for every share that, that I own. I, I didn't start the company. I I took one over, so it's pretty easy to do due diligence. So I think we're excited. I think we're blessed to be in the right area. Uh, we're going to use all the advantages that we have. 
And uh, we're looking, and, you know, and like as Gwen was saying, you know, these things are happening, uh, you know, ups and downs, but everything is setting up for a gold market. And my goodness, I think we're, uh, we're in the right place at the right time. So and we're really excited to, uh, for what the future may hold for us. So with that, uh, that's my presentation. Thank you, Brad. That was uh, that was great. You can certainly just leave your slides up there. I'll leave it looking at your screen because some of these questions refer to specific things that are uh, that you went through. So we might as well just leave your your PowerPoint so as. That on. I can look back and forth to, uh, to slides if somebody wanted to. Okay. Perfect. Uh, this is a good place to start because there's a few questions about um, share ownership. So uh, I'll. Let's first talk about Eric Sprott. Let's talk about uh, how much he owns and whether you think um, in a financing that is upcoming, do you think he would participate to maintain? Um, are you in conversation with him? What can you say about that? Okay. I'm just asking the questions yeah, that are being no, 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 it's for. good. It's a great question. And, and uh, you know, and, and never diss the godfather, right? I, I have been in great communication with his team uh, quite frequently. Uh, especially when I was doing these, um, trying to do these transactions that we um, uh, just announced today. Obviously, I wanted his opinion on it because, you know, I, I did take, you know, 30% of my cash and just got rid of it. Uh, and him being the second largest shareholder, I uh, wanted to make sure, you know, I, that, it, you know, he was, uh, be happy with that. And, and so, I, like, I have, my relationship is fantastic. We're in great contact. Uh, I have not discussed uh, him uh, or anybody for that matter. I mean, I have firms trying to give me money right now, but I have not, until I solidify what it is, he'll be my first phone call, but I can't tell you what, you know, Eric Sprott's doing from day to day, but he's, uh, I can tell you he's hes happy with us. That's for sure. Uh, that That's one thing I can say, and, and he'll be the first phone call when I do uh, get a final uh, decision of, of when, what, high, and how much money I'm, I'm, we're going to raise. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah. While while we're on the shareholder um, question here, uh, there were one or two questions. One or two people had asked, "You're the biggest shareholder. What percentage do you actually hold?" Well, I think I'm 0.1 percent more than Eric. <laughs> 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 actually, in my mind, and it's funny because I I was looking through. I'm I'm 12 percent of the company, and then I have you know, incentives and, and such, but yeah, I'm about 12% now. I'd like to say from, uh, to beat my chest, oh, is, is I was 20% a year ago and I diluted myself down by bringing in the right people. So, um, you know, and then when I was at 20%, I was buying shares in the market just to try and keep things good. But now we've, uh, I've diluted myself down uh, for the better of the company. So I'm about 12%, I think, right at this moment. Yeah. Okay. Um someone says do you have a timeline for when you'll be back in the field i know it's not certain but negotiations with the taltan and niska first nations will be important i know you you have good community relations um but what requirements are there there and do you have a timeline idea okay that's a great question um the answer is we'll start with the niska first i am kind of local to the area I've raised my family in smithers that's uh um wet sweat and land but i mean and the, and, and the Nishka, so I'm very familiar with the area. I was supposed to be up meeting uh, with the Nishka two weeks ago. Obviously, we um, we delayed that meeting. But my uh, again, knock on wood. But I mean, my my relationships are fantastic. Uh, again, I know lots of people for you know 20 years plus from the community. So we're happy with that relationship. And up until now. You know, we just been exploration, accumulating land. We have their blessings. Uh, as soon as it's safe to go out and kind of go back up north, uh, New Ianch will be exactly where I'll be going. Uh, that That's the main little town uh, just outside of Terrace. So, you know, I can see myself soon as soon as it's safe uh, to go back up north. Now, I have a home up north. I'm actually on Vancouver Island right now, but I also got to get to, I got a bunch of equipment and stuff in Smithers. I need to get up there. So I'll, I'll be going to see the Nishka as soon as it's safe to go and everybody feels comfortable. Um, what was the second part of the question, Gwen? Sorry. Just tell, are there actual permitting requirements that need to be met um, to get going in the field again? No, no. So we've, 
we're fully permitted uh, or maybe not, maybe I'm waiting for something in the mail, but I think we just paid the bond for the Summit Lake drilling. Uh, the other permits we've had, they're, they're good for another four years. Um, when can we get on the ground? Now, I was talking to Stuart yesterday. It's a lot of snow up there. Uh, you know, uh, I'll probably give Derek White a call next week because they're back and forth from Ascot. You know, we can start working on those southern lands probably early June. Um, right now, that would be our, our guess. As soon as we can go up there, we will. Uh, Scotty Gold, I mean, we were on site last year on the 18th of June. Uh, as soon as we can get up there, we'll go. If team's ready, I've got, we've got everybody ready to go, but we'll wait by the weather and then also just see what society is going to let us do. I think they've, 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 they've claimed that mining's uh, essential, so that's great. Uh, I've talked to all the contractors, everybody's chomping and ready to go. So as soon as we can get up there, we'll, we'll be up there. But I mean, we really aren't on site until June 1st at, at earliest, and we'll only be able to do those lower work work on those lower grounds while the snow recedes um what uh what companies out there other explorers would you say are good comps comparables for scotty and do you know I, i'm sort of merging two questions one question was where do you think scotty's share price will be in a year and this other one is what are good comps to scotty maybe who are slightly more advanced and do you know what kind of uh, valuations they're getting maybe per ounce in the ground or you know just a little bit of perspective on price and comparables sure and this is where you get yourself in trouble um but for me now now i'm just talking from from the president of a company who's going to be very promotional but i go i look at skina i look at tudor i look at gt gold right um i've got 700 drill holes i've got fantastic geology that's who I'd love to be my peers comparable to with. Um, they're hundred million dollar companies. Today I'm still languishing, I don't know, 17 million or $15 million market cap today. I think I could stand shoulder to shoulder with those guys. Now that's coming from me. Now, who am I comparable with geologically is different than financially in her share structure and stuff. So a lot of people go, oh, it's Bruce Jack, it's Bruce Jack. Well, no, it's a little bit of different deposit than, than the Bruce Jack or maybe even Ascot. I think the closest analog geologically would be the SNP mine. And that's a report that we had from a, a, a structural geologist, Dave Reese, who did his master's at SNP. He's the one who came up with the theories that, that we hit those three zones. We kind of worked from a report that he put together. So geologically, I think we're reoccurring dilational jogs or sigmoidal loops. Uh, Scotty was never explored that way. That's the theory. That's where we're having our success following that theme. So I'd love to be compared to SNP Mine because they only took 100,000 ounces out of uh, Scotty and they took a million out of SNP. So for geologically now, but from a, you know, exploration company, you know, I, I would love to, you know, I think I'm one season away where people kind of go, well, if, you know, X, Y, and Z, and I gave you the three companies. I'm sure they, they, they'd like to think I'm a lot smaller, but that, that's what I'm driving towards. Uh, Ascot's different beast, right? Because they're more of in the, the development stage of that Lasan curve or the up and down of the W recovery, right? Um, so I wouldn't compare myself uh, with Ascot. But geologically, I would. As, as you now Ascot is finding all these great little pods of, of, of gold. And, you know, and, and so as they go further north, you get closer to Scotty while well, their grades seem to be getting a little bit better as they go up, up north. So I think geologically you could compare me to ask Scott. Uh, just a lot less work done on, on Scotty than there is done at the Premier. But I don't know, does that answer your question? <laughs> sure. As much as I expected it to be answered. <laughs> um, can you flip to page seven of your presentation? I think it has a bunch of tables on it. And the question was just, please explain the tables um, for each. Please explain the tables. The numbers um, have a lot of range to them. So, yeah, I think maybe we just went through this quickly. So if you want to just jump back. Sure. And, 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 you know, we're excited about this. And I, I appreciate whoever's asking the question because I don't, we're like Rod, Rodney Dangerfield. We never get any respect because they're like, oh, they're just surface results. Um, and it'd be better for Thomas to be on here to answer these questions. but. 
you know, this is literally our first pass on land that we had no information on. And so you see, you know, down here at uh, Top Rope and, and the mare, what, what be it, I mean, very high silver grades. I mean, even five grams gold on surface to find those things. That's fantastic, right? Um, and just knowing that m much of the Golden Triangle, like, I mean, this was staked first time in, in 1914 right i mean it's you know so there's tons of information to go to a lot of these lands there was zero information on this and quite frankly 15 20 years ago it was all covered in ice um you know so no one had ever gotten to it so you know what i'd like people to know is that if, if we knew that those results are as good as that you're looking at on on, on the screen we would have spent a lot more time there well we're excited to get back in there now because all five of those deserve heavy follow-up on, right? And and so so we're, we're we're excited. But if I was to really want somebody to take take away, you know, the main thing is is that first time that we ever saw these rocks. Is that we just walk the margins of the glacier. That's all we've done. I mean, next this season coming, you know, there's there's a lot of work. Oh, and I'd love to point out, and, I, and I'm sorry, this red. Uh, dotted line through here that's the grand duke tunnel right which uh that that accesses the grand duke mine it's a 12 kilometer tunnel but five kilometers of that goes through our land we have access to that tunnel this season last year we didn't um but we we've, we've struck a deal with castle resources that we're going to be able to go in there and map that's an inverted five kilometer drill hole <laughs> we're excited about that uh we did we mapped a, a two kilometer tunnel here on scotty you know, and every sample had had gold to it, and we, as high as eight grams, and it gave us a lot of clues where to go look up on the surface. Well, we're hoping to get the same thing uh, with access to that tunnel. Again, it's just it's never been mapped. Goes through that land. Uh, um, we're excited to get through uh, into that tunnel as well. Work it. Okay, let's stick with some um, slightly more technical questions here. So I'm going to put two together here. One is. What is the estimated true width on the blueberry vein? That's where you had got uh, 7.4 grams over 30, almost 35 meters. And then the yeah. similar question is on the M zone, that looks like an interesting hit on the top of the structure. Was this zone expected or was, a, was it a surprise? And sort of what do you know about the M zone? So yeah, both the width on the blueberry vein and was the M zone expected or a surprise? And what do you know about its continuity? Okay, so Thomas, who's very conservative, would tell you that the true width will probably be 85% of that. We need to, you know, we'll be able to extrapolate a, a, a better answer next season. Um, but that's that's what he would say for there. So I'm comfortable saying this. This was uh, very, this is my favorite hole. This is Thomas. Thomas's favorite hole is, is, is the blueberry vein. I like the M zone. I love the question because uh it was a 500 meter hole so we could tag the end of that m zone which was the vein that produced it all basically it's a 50 meter step out in front of the mine and the theory was and you can see the, i don't know if you can how the resolution is but you can see all these drill traces here this is all from underground workings and that's pretty much all the work was always drilling from underground where you could never tag that vein perpendicular they're all east-west structures and you can see here there's just so, so many of these structures we just got to find the bigger ones um because it's a 50 meter step out in front of the mine and it's 11 meters which is a lot wider than what the you know the average width of scotty gold is three meters I, I think would be the the correct answer they thought the vein anytime they thought you know their most of their holes were like 60 meters long and then if the vein pinched out they just stopped drilling that's my understanding well the theory was that this vein the m zone pinched out well we see it getting wider and because it's a 50 meter step out right in front of that vein in the mine, you can get excited. Uh, now, I'm not allowed to say numbers or what be it, and Thomas would get mad, but I mean, you, you know, just go eight grams by <laughs> eight feet by 300 meters, which is, you know, it's it's, it's interesting for us. So, I mean, we're, we're going to do a lot more work here and we'll probably wedge out and try and get uh, a lot more drilling down here and get a real good feeling for what's down there. So it was a surprise. It was a theory, um, and the theory came through. But it was, it was a surprise because that was my most expensive drill hole. It was 500 meter hole to hit 11 meters at the bottom of it, right? And that's what we were targeting. 
And we, and we thought, you know, these ozone, P zone, we wanted to see those from a different perspective, but so it was very surprising. And, and like I say, I, you know, we, we step out another 50 meters and we get anything similar to that. I think people could get really excited. And like I say, in the blueberry zone, we'll just be doing nice light step outs from there. Uh, it's a whole new find for us. So it goes in a total different direction than what was previously thought or work done in the past. So it's like a new discovery. I'm excited. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we touched on you touched on this um, briefly in your presentation, but let's just if you have a little bit more. I don't know if your plans are completely solidified at this point, but um, if you were to go to the field and do those five thousand meters, how would they be broken out amongst the bend, the vein, the Scotty, and the Domino zone? Well, I would say two thirds of the drilling will go across Scotty, Blueberry, and the bend. Our first hole will be Blueberry. I'll guarantee that. Uh, a, because it's a skid hole, uh, B, it's got the best potential to keep good news flow going. Um, I would say the bend vein will do maybe 15% of our drilling, 10% of the drilling. We're really going to focus on the bow and the blueberry, and then we'll do a whole third of our drilling will come on the domino zone. And because again, if this plays out, I mean, they started the Scotty gold mine from finding a vein on surface that was smaller than what we're seeing on the other side of the mountain. So we will, we, we, we will focus the exploration wildcat drilling over here. And so we're gonna have to fan out a whole bunch. We won't do any super long holes, but we'll just do con confirmation uh, here. So I, I think, you know, this is the blue sky. We'll, we'll, we'll probably, you know, 30, 30% of our drilling will be here, if not 40. And then we're gonna go to these nice safe, uh, zones on, on the other blueberry and, and uh scotty but i i know with scotty where uh again i'm not the technical guy but they're gonna we'll drill another one down here another 50 meters and then we'll start wedging it out just to really get a feel for how long this this vein can go for so that's you know again thomas is probably better to speak about that but i've heard the, the story enough that that it's pretty much i'm regurgitating what he'd say yeah. i'm certainly excited i mean I'm keen to see what Domino can turn up because I feel like that's a, a a potential scope changer for the project. But that's just my my insight, yeah, my uh, perspective. And that's um, what you're in this business for, right? I mean, that's the same for us. I mean, the size of the prize, right? Exactly. We show a pathway. I don't need to come up with a resource, but if I can show a, a logical pathway to, I mean, if, if Domino does connect with the end zone, oh my goodness! Again, we need to do more work. But if it, it is true. I mean, we're not talking a couple million ounces, that's for sure. Yeah. So we still have more work to do, and I don't want to get too promotional, but I can tell you we've done the science, we've done all the the work, you know, to put us in the position to to step up to the batter's box, and we uh, we fully intend to to take a few swings at, at some balls here. We're we're excited. Yeah. It's not I'll like the gold do... is uh, a a uh, border between uh, Ascot and Peridium. The, you know it, it doesn't know who staked what i mean we think we think we're in a uh, really good shape here for some success so we'll try and get through just a few more questions here because we've been online for an hour already and we don't want to take up too much of everyone's time um i've had a few questions about permitting there is a historic mine there are there permits related to that mine um yeah what's the situation yeah, absolutely. so another big box that we check is Scotty Gold is a permitted mine. I mean, I think I have a mining permit. It's permit M139. It's There's a mill there. I'm not telling people I'm going mining. It's not a development story. But the fact is is that if we, we find the, the things that we want to find and, and the next guy comes in and, and, and takes this over, that could be very attractive for somebody. Again, there's a mine. It's, it's a small permit. So it's only 75,000 ton a year. But with that power line going through the property right here and having a mine permit, it changes, you know, how long does it take to get a permit? It takes a very long time. All we, I, From my understanding, and we've done lots of work with the government, um, I just got to make sure that the seven kilometers of, of uh, tunnels uh, that are in the Scotty gold mine are just safe. And that that's my understanding. Again, dealing with the government, it could change. But I mean, technically, you know, I could probably be years and years and years advance of anybody if someone decided that we wanted to put a mine there uh, because there is that permit. You can't take the okay. permit away 
I just have to make sure that it's in compliance with today's rules. Gotcha. Yeah, uh, so that's a big thing. That's can you talk job. a bit about your team? I mean, you touched on the fact that your board is uh, diverse and pretty experienced, but can you talk a bit about your team and their experience and successes? That's the question. Sure. Um, we'll start with Thomas. Uh, since he's the vice president of exploration, I, I feel very uh, blessed to have him come on board. And I had to really kind of twist his arm. He he, he had a, a full-time job before. He, he was the program head at BCIT young PhD and I was like he was on my relogging program I'd like to say that before I had a full-time geologist had equity exploration do all my technical work because I'm a business guy and I'm going if I start trying to talk geology people just look at me like I'm crazy but I know that if I put the you know some of the brightest guys on it and equity exploration certainly has a fantastic reputation in the industry they do a lot of work at Red Chris they have pure gold and such so Thomas in the summer times loves to hang from mountains and rappel and was doing all, you know, the golden triangle is, is very uh, rugged terrain. And so he ended up on my relogging program in 2018. And at that time I was operational CEO. I built the camp. I was 60 days in a sleeping bag up there and I could tell he liked it. I could tell I was just going, why are you in academia? Yeah. You're, you know, you, you're a mountaineering guy, blah, blah, blah. And he just said, look, every time I graduated, it was a downturn. And so I was able to get him to leave uh, the BCIT and come full time. So that was probably the smartest thing I ever did. Uh, when my first board member, so this company was called something else. All the board, there's no original board members. There's, you know, we kind of cleaned this this thing out right from the studs and, and, and grew it. But one of the first guys to join the board and help me out was Ernie Mast. Now, Ernie's been helping me out for years. Ernie's more of a C-suite uh executive yeah i think he was a ceo of new gold he was uh built cobre panama uh built a tin mine in, in dominican republic so he's you know he's held these big big positions and, and so he had just left pomero uh he was the president of P pomero but i think they put him into pomero to uh to try and save that chip uh but that's ernie's story to tell but he uh he's been helping me out for for uh over three years now which is fantastic john williamson uh was really really fortunate to have john williamson join the board uh, john williamson's a legend in, in junior mining he's you know committee bay kamenak uh he's currently benchmark meadows alta plano he knows the junior game very well and it's been very successful so the way i was trying to get a diverse board is i have a bigger company guy because i'm really trying to put together is something that that's going to be attractive to, to, to bigger entities. I've got a guy who understands the junior uh, market very well, been very successful. He's a geologist as well. Um, Steve Stein is on my board now. He's not a mining guy, but I'm a founding member of a company called Black Diamond Camps from, from way back when. But what Steve lends to it is he's an operational uh, superstar, but he built Black Diamond Camps to a $2 billion company from scratch. I was there when they put it on a napkin um and he's an accredited board member so I, that, I wanted steve to come in and go look i want to act like a big company i want an accredited guy so we can have get all these contracts in place like we're we're just let's just start punching above our weight so that's why i brought steve in 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 on on the board seat and as i mentioned earlier i still have a board seat open uh looking to find somebody who who would add to the board uh in, in diverse whether you know, I, I mean, I, I, in my mind, I have the perfect person, but it, it, it's difficult time. So that's the board. I brought on uh, Raheem has been helping out with corporate development. Now he's out of Toronto. He's been very, very uh, uh, helpful. He comes kind of been on the buy side, sell side. He was a portfolio manager at US Global at one time. Uh, he's a really warm introduction to some of these uh, bigger entities that we, we like to, to talk to. So I think we, we've got a board that has everybody has different skills uh, i certainly run the company by the board um you know which is the way it's supposed to be uh and and you know i don't dictate anything i'm, uh, I'm constantly asking questions and, and to do things right and i don't always do what they all say but i mean i think collectively you know there's a lot of paper that goes back and forth a lot of zoom meetings and and, and stuff so it seems to be working out really well so i'm really happy with the the, the shoulders i sit on to, to help me through this so it's good. I, I'm proud of it. We're, we're, we're happy.
Okay, I'll just do one last question, which is you obviously border both Predium and Ascot. Are either of those companies doing exploration work that's close to the property line? Well, Ascot, um, we'll find this map. Ascot keeps moving further north, uh, doing a lot of work up and around here. I can tell you that not last season, but the season before, Pridium drilled all summer, all along here, uh, right on the borderline. In fact, you know, I could have took a driver because like I say, I taught when I was relogging core and building the camp and cleaning up the site here, I could have took a one wood and I could have hit their drill with a, you know, if I was launching golf balls off off, off the our, our campsite. So they, and they stayed there pretty much all summer. So uh, that's exciting. Um, you know, I can't tell you too much about what's going on down here, except that, you know, we did a lot of work in here last season. And there's a lot of, there's two past producing silver mines. I, I forgot to mention that. Um, from, they're from the 40s, but they are two past producing mines down the south part here. But, you know, Ascot's been, they bought the silver coin, which is in this area here. The further north they go, they're getting better and better uh, results. Um, you know, and I can't speak to what Peridium's results were, but they, you know, the, it's non-stop work. They've been working hard, hard down in the southern end. So they've got some theory. I don't know what it is, but I know they're they're putting a lot of effort into it. Interesting. Well, I think maybe we'll wrap it up there. We've been online for uh, for an hour and a quarter. So uh, I certainly, I think I would speak for Brad as well, saying uh, we appreciate everyone's interest and time. Um, I, I have found these days working from home busier actually than than many days because there's so many events like this, webinars and Zoom calls and whatnot to uh, to bounce back and forth between. So certainly thank you everyone uh, for your attention, for your questions, for your interest. And I certainly know that Brad is keen to answer any questions that you might have. And as he mentioned, if uh, if you have more technical stuff, Thomas is a great is great at explaining things. I've learned a lot about this project from conversations with Thomas. So. Brad can put you in touch with him. And uh, on my part, thank you so much for uh, for tuning in. If you have any questions for me, I'm easy to find as well. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll just say I'll just say thanks. Do you have anything else you want to say there, Brad? No, I I, I appreciate everybody's time and and uh, please reach out, ask questions, and keep keep stay tuned, right? Because there's again, as as we started off this conversation is. There could be opportunity coming here in the near future. Oh, and I'll stand up. I'll show you. This is the best part of working from home. <laughs> Only Brad. I've got, I've got my shorts on and I, and I put my first jacket on since PDAC. So I thought that was funny. Uh, but anyways, uh, appreciate everybody's time. Stay safe. Be positive. And, and uh, opportunity's coming. It really, really is. Uh, don't miss out. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.